Okay. Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome to Out on Campus with Virtual TCC. Today we have our Lethe and Gabri Gabrielle leading GSA in our guest uh, presentation for kind of, you know, just community development and learning about the resources that are available to you on uh, in the Hampton Roads community. Take it away, Alethe and Gabrielle. All right, so um, as Ms. Alicia said, my name is Arlethea. Um, I am in my final semesters at TCC. Um, I'm a graphic design multimedia major, and I identify as, well, a couple things. So bisexual, non-binary, pansexual, like, I mean, I like what I like. I'm not really into labels, but, um, um, and my pronouns are pretty much the feminine pronouns she, her, but I don't mind the they or much of anything really, honestly. Um, so welcome to Out on Campus. And Gabrielle, you can introduce yourself too. Hello everybody, I'm Gabrielle. This is my first uh, semester at TCC. I am currently in the degree for science, but I am considering to change it into computer science. Um, my pronouns are whatever you want, because I really, it doesn't really bother me personally. Uh, I am attracted to females. <laughs> that's all. That's really pretty much it. Um, I enjoy a wide, wide variety of things as well. So. Um, so we have three amazing speakers today that are going to present and share their input and just really give us some knowledge and tips. So first up, we have um, Hampton Rose Pride Representative, Dr. Charles Ford. Um, he is amazing. I have heard your name around, so I know you're going to be good. <laughs> um, next, after him, we have Casey Butler. He is representing the LGBT um, Life Center. And then we have from ODU, the Gay and Cultural Studies Director, Kathleen Rhodes. So all three of them are going to basically give us some information that we can use to help us with resources. So without further ado, Dr. Charles Ford, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and share anything else that you want to share and start with. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Charles Ford. I am Professor of History at uh, Norfolk State University. I've worked there 28 years. Uh, and I've also advised uh, the student group their legacy for several years in the 2000s, about 2015. Um, I've been involved on the national level with uh, the American Association of University Professors, their um, Sex Diversity and Gender Identity Committee. Uh, we had several grants around the turn of the century to put in the non-discrimination clauses on college campuses. And I've also worked at Old Dominion with Kathleen and others to put together the Gay Studies Endowment uh, for about 10 years. So I've mean, done a lot of stuff on the, on the state, local and national levels. But I've seen a lot of changes too here. And it's remarkable, here I am uh, as a representative of Hampton Rose Pride. Uh, I've served on the Pride Board since 2017. I was elected and re-elected last year for another term. Um, I, I served as secretary recently uh, from 2018 to 2020. And now I'm just a rank and file board member. And I've done the history experience at the uh, festival in June where we've had various placards and I've given tours and We've had Kathleen take interviews with her students. And so it's been very, very, um, very, very comprehensive. So, and some years are better than others, but constantly, I think, improvement over, over time, uh, that experience. Uh, so every June we have this, uh, this uh, almost like a museum, a mobile museum there on, on, on the, the festival grounds uh, and gets more inclusive and more comprehensive every year, I think much better. Um, but Pride itself, Hampton Roads Pride um, is open, membership is open to all. Um, uh, it's $10 a year if you want to join. 
Uh, and of course, with membership, you get to vote on officers, you get to determine policy, to determine the direction of the organization. Uh, Pride itself is about uh, 31 years old. It, it developed in 1988, and the first Pride Fest was in a small park in Norfolk, North, Northside Park in July of, 19, of 1989. Uh, and um, again, it took a long time for Pride or Pride Fest to come to Virginia. If you'd imagine a state in 1985 or six that had no Prides at all. <laughs> now we have so many of them. We have Farmville Pride, we have uh, Floyd has a Pride. Or, I mean, there's so many Prides all over uh, Virginia now, but that was not the case um, 35 years ago. Uh, and therefore, uh, coming to Virginia, it took a long time because, of course, the first pride was the commemoration of the Stonewall riots um, uh, in, in New York in 1969. So the first pride march uh, was in 1970. And so it took, took uh, Hampton Roads, you know, almost 20 years <laughs> to, to catch up to the time. But we've caught up. And now Pride Fest, um, in, in 2019, we, we attracted more people than Harbor Fest to Norfolk. Uh, 40,000 people <laughs> uh, came to the, the, the park that day. So that, that's incredible. Now, of course, could that happen again with pandemics and social disorder and unrest? We don't know. Uh, probably not for the first, you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, we'll have that large of a, an event, but we will have uh, smaller events um, and events that uh, students can get involved in. I have a whole stem of programming from history to like a family. So we have a family area, a history part, a, a main stage and a club stage, right? So what we're gonna do is break all those up into separate parts instead of having the 40,000 people <laughs> there. Uh, we'll have smaller venues online venues, maybe a smaller audience, you know, a socially distanced audience. Um, with the history experience, uh, I'm thinking of taking it out of downtown, which we've done mainly the tours there with the history experience and having bus tours or things from beamed in from various cities, from all seven cities, uh, <laughs> something like that. Uh, that. That kind of thing, more ambitious, but also I think more comprehensive and more inclusive ultimately. And then just looking at you know some of the the cis gay white mate, white men at downtown what they did right so it's much more actually if you look more broadly geographically it becomes more more inclusive um, and of course working with Kathleen and and um, uh, her oral history project uh, we, we we've we've gathered stories over the years and archived stories and people have given their stories at Pride. Um, and that's part of this, I think the narrative that's so important, the part about Pride is the story, right? History, <laughs> it's the stories, the narratives, the themes and the things we can develop and use that to what change uh, the present, right? And, and make the present better. So people don't have to go through some of the obstacles and horrors and awful things that they did in the past. Um, so Hampton Rose Pride is advocacy, we do advocacy. We try to be nonpartisan, but of course we, we support mainly Democrats, but we can't say that. <laughs> so, but pol policy things, we um, push forward, you know, all, all candidates, and there's a few Republicans that, that agree with us, but mainly we, we, we support uh, those, those candidates, candidacies and issues that uh, help our, our, our communities, our various communities. Um, we have a transgender outreach. We have um, we have all kinds of uh, newer uh, outreach to um, you know all kinds of groups. We have the most diverse board, I think. We're a working board, so we don't uh, we don't have an executive director. So so as a volunteer, it's really another job for you. <laughs> it's unpaid, but it's a lot of uh, you know work of love for people, and we have the most diverse board I think ever in terms of. Uh, gender and um, and race and ethnicity, you know, the, the most uh, diverse. And even age, right, Dr. Ford, because Jamar Davis is a former student of ours yeah. at, here at TCC, yes. now on the board. He was recently elected, yes. Uh, so, and um, it, it takes a, a real village. It takes all kinds of people to do that because it takes uh, 200000 to $300,000 to put on an annual uh, Pride Fest. So it, 
So you have to tap into all kinds of people to get all that kind of money. <laughs> it's not just one one group, one small clicks. You know, it's 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 a it's a broad effort, uh, ranging effort, and really again. Um, you know, unlike Richmond, uh, which had separate African-American or women prides, we've always had an inclusive pride, right? Um, so that, that hasn't been the case um, in, in, in many Southern places. And also uh, one thing though, the big emphasis is on respectability. <laughs> so, the, the, so we can't have the kind of, you know, what would be considered outrageous in Tidewater, the kind of the outfits or the, you know, the parades. Our parade is more more of a sedate uh, boat parade, you know, uh, which is the only boat parade in well in North America, I think, uh, until recently. Amsterdam's the only other place, right? So, and why respectability? Because Hammond Rose Pride actually came out of a effort to stop the harassment of or, or the entrapment of gay men in in public parks and public spaces, and the idea of of Pride Fest was to show how respectable and assimilated we were, right? In terms of, you know, throwing frisbees and no alcohol at all, and having families at, at the picnic in uh, Northside Park. And that's sort of still the same thing. I mean, it's a more G-rated, more PG-rated um, uh, show. Uh, one of the performers uh, dropped some F-bombs and we're like, oh my God, no, the city. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but those kinds of things, you know, the kind of respectability, that's still there too. So that, that's a tradition too. That, that actually fits the area, you know, and, and, and applies to 40,000 people. You know, it's a very mainstream, sort of mainstreaming idea in that sense. Um, but we do uh, love difference too. We have all kinds of different people, but we have, we, we, we note the, um, some of the, the rougher edges of the, of the community, you know, the, or the you know, more explicit sexuality. And that's always been sort of, you know, frowned upon at least by, the, by, by Hampton Rose Pride. That kind of thing. So that's that's the Hampton Rose Pride story. <laughs> um, so it's one I think a successful one too. It's it's, it's uh, we have like five hundred paid members, and again we're always looking for people to come to our meetings, which are held every um, every first Monday, uh, usually Zoom, and you can go to the website and see our you know you get the get the uh, link. To go to the Zoom meetings, we've had also meetings at um, various restaurants, socially distanced, like a, like a, a brewery, a uh, smart mouth brewery on the ocean front. That's where we had our, our elections. So, okay. well, thank uh, you for sharing history. Um, did you say something, Gabrielle? Oh, I was about to say that as well, and then also ask like if anybody had any questions so far. Besides. Well, um, again, thank you for sharing that. I did not know the history of Hampton Rose Pride. Um, one, I'm not native to the area, so I didn't know a lot of that. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, well, I, it's remarkable. I've always thought that right after Stonewall, we would have had a pride, right? Just like the other place, but it took a long time yeah. to do it. For that to happen, and once it happened, it's it's become very very um, popular, and um, now almost mainstream. Like I said, I mean, forty thousand people above, you know, that's larger than Harbor Fest, which is you know a big thing downtown. So, um, and we've expanded also to the oceanfront too, and that's an idea, you know, in the future to maybe have a a pride on the beach, you know, literally like uh, something in the water, something like that. That would be very fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. That's I'm here fun. for it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you again. Um, next, we have speaking. Where did I go? Um, we have the LGBT Life Center um, representative, Casey Butler. Um, you, so you can just jump in and pick up where he left off, share anything that you would like to share. Great. Thank you so much for, for the introduction, Alithia. I am Casey Butler. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator here at the LGBT Life Center. Um, we have been uh, serving the HIV and LGBTQ plus communities 
in some form for the past 30 years. So that's funny you mentioned the first Pride in 1989 because that's actually when we started as Candy House, um, which was uh, a nonprofit that served women and children living with HIV. Um, throughout the years, we've um, expanded our services to all people living with HIV, and then more recently to the greater LGBTQ plus community. So um, back in 2011, we um, started the LGBT Center of Hampton Roads, which was a program of um, access AIDS care, which is what we became known as. And then eventually in 2017, we merged the two into the LGBT Life Center. So um, we, uh, yeah, we have, um, I guess I should talk a little bit more about myself before I get into that. Um, I, I use he, she, and they pronouns interchangeably. And um, I am an out and proud non-binary person. I identify as queer as well. Um, and I am all about centering and uplifting those voices that have been marginalized within our community. Um, I think of women, um, queer people of color, immigrants, um, gender non-conforming and trans folks, you know, thinking of through our history and the movement and, and how um, we can do better um, and, and within our community and be an example um, for others. Um, so I, I have a master's in, of science in sociology uh, with a specialization in gender and sexuality from the University of Amsterdam, which was mentioned earlier as another boat parade. Um, I've been to the, the boat parade and it's a pretty wild uh, affair. Um, and, uh, and what else? I'm originally from Fort Worth, Texas, and I have a history of working in higher education. So I'm very familiar with college campuses and um, higher education administration and student orgs. And I was actually the chair of our Pride and Equity Faculty Staff Association at UT. Um, so we did a lot of work around intersectionality but also intergenerational um, learning and community building. We really tried to focus on ways in which faculty and staff could, um, could partner with student organizations and, and offer leadership opportunities for students and just work on projects together. Um, so that was a big focus of ours um, when I was in that position. Um, so I'm really passionate about community building and knowledge sharing and um, questioning, you know, power and privilege and looking at ways that we can dismantle systems of oppression, you know, within our agencies and institutions. I think it's, it all starts with, you know, us and doing that work. Um, and it's, it's a collaborative affair. We all, you know, need to, to pull our weight and, and do, do our part. So I'm really so blessed to be in this position. My role as community engagement coordinator is really working with volunteers, donors, third parties, any third parties to the agency. Um, I do speaking engagements. We have trainings and workshops. Um, we offer a lot of different services. So I'm kind of that uh, point person for, for anyone that's not a client. Um, but um, so I'm not that kind of um, outward facing uh, contact. So, so yeah, I'm really excited to partner with um, uh, the Tide, Tidewater Community College and your, your Gender and Sexuality Alliance. I think it's so important to have those spaces um, for LGBTQ plus folks. And um, yeah, I would love to uh, do a quick screen share and just walk you through our website so you know kind of what services we have to offer. And I'll point out a few different things of note. Um, so let me go ahead and share my- Made you a co-host. Okay, perfect. All righty, let's see here. All right, so if you go to lgbtlifecenter.org, this is our homepage, and you can easily scroll through the homepage just to get an idea of some of the things that we offer, um, testing and wellness. A lot of what we do is based around health. Um, so we have a health clinic out at Monticello at the Fort Tarlofs. Um, so they offer primary care, testing, um, prep services, there's a bunch of things you can get at the clinic. We also offer testing services at our um, Court One location, which is on 24th and Llewellyn. Um, so we have a mental health clinic as well. So um, we offer sliding scale, we accept insurance, Medicaid. So, you know, if, if I don't know what your, your situation is like at TCC, and I'm sure most colleges have some sort of counseling hours that you can get as a student. Is that not the case? 
There? No? Okay. Um, so, I want to say a couple of years ago, like in 2018, I think that was the last time I heard of a counselor being on campus. Okay. Um, Miss Lucy can't correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But yes, um, during some unfortunate cutbacks at the college, our pro professional counsel counselors were eliminated and we no longer have any sort of personal counseling available at Tywater Community College, which is one of the primary reasons I'm so invested in finding the resources that our students need so that I can support them in maintaining their livelihood and their personal development as well as their persistence at the college. Nice. So this would be a great resource for, you know, LGBTQ plus folks at the college. Um, please feel free to refer them to us. Um, all you need to do is call us and ask for mental health services and they'll connect you um, with our staff. Um, so I can actually quickly show you that if you, since we have our top nav bar here, you can also look at this. So if you go to mental health, since we're talking about that, um, this will kind of get you some more information about our services. Um, you know, I mentioned sliding scale. Um, so this is just, uh, uh, all of our counselors are LGBTQ plus affirming. Um, they've been through many trainings and oftentimes are part of the community. Um, so, and this is something that you can also request when you call us. If you have, you know, specific requests for, um, you know, the type of counselor that you would like, um, down to sometimes the identity that they have. If you're looking for someone that's non-binary or a person of color, you know, make sure you, you make those known because that can really help with the success, um, successful mental health outcomes when you're in a counseling situation. And we know that oftentimes, you know, maybe the counseling isn't related to your gender and sexuality and that's fine too, but just knowing that you have somebody there that's affirming um, in case those issues do come up. So, so you can see kind of some of the issues that we address. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. So, um, so yeah, please reach out with any other issues. Um, so you can see this is our um, Director of Mental Health Services, Dr. Corey Gerwey, as well as some of our staff um, counselors. We also have plenty of um, interns as well that work with us. So we have an internship program in mental health as well. So, um, so yeah, um, so if we go back. I wanna show you. So we do offer uh, extensive HIV services. Um, so if you, you are living with HIV, please reach out to us. We can help with medical case management, um, benefits coordination, transportation to medical appointments. We even offer housing assistance for not just people living with HIV, but LGBTQ plus folks as well. So if you find yourself with housing insecurity at any moment, please reach out to us and we'll get, we'll get you connected to the continuum of care. Um, let's see, there's our mission. Um, we look to empower the LGBTQ plus communities and all people affected by HIV through improving health and wellness, strengthening families and communities, and providing transformative education and advocacy. So you can see we also have um, this uh, events. So if you are ever interested in looking at our calendar and events, you can do that here. Um, I do wanna point out, we have a support group for young adults. So um, that might be something that you're interested in joining or sharing with your peers. Um, that happens the third Wednesday of every month. You might notice on our calendar, a lot of things um, say not meeting until further notice due to COVID. But we do have about seven support groups that are still meeting virtually. So feel free to check that out. Um, I'll pull up the one for actually meets tomorrow. So it's the young adult group on the edge and I can click here and just pull that up and it shows you here the next one is tomorrow um, but it is a recurring event so if you just add a you know a reminder to your calendar the third Wednesday of every month from six to eight um, this is our group it's for 18 to 25 year olds and it's this open safe space for anyone that identifies as LGBTQ plus. Um, so to RSVP and get that Zoom link, all you need to do is email Zane Welsh, who is my co-facilitator. We actually um, work, um, we facilitate the group together. So I, you also get to hang out with me if you're um, so inclined. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I did want to point that out. But yeah, events and the calendar is a great way to look um, just for upcoming things that are going on. Um, we do have a monthly community day. 
Um, that's actually, since everything has gone to appointment only, um, we, uh, we offer a day, the last Friday of every month from three to seven, where people can actually walk in and get information about our services and get tested right there. So um, that next one is going to be happening on Friday, the 30th of October. Um, just want to see. So I mentioned the clinic, testing, HIV services, mental health. So support groups. I didn't mention the young adult support group, but I just want to show you a list of what other um, support groups we have. We have discussion groups. So we have um, some around trans issues, um, men's groups, parents groups. Um, so check those out. And there's some special, um, you know, trans groups and youth groups. Um, if you have younger siblings or people that you know that are within the ages of 11 to 18, we do have a, a group for those folks too. So, so you might want to, you know, share that with your um, younger um, friends and family members. Um, we are trying to get this game night started up again. I'm really, I think it's really important um, to have not only discussion groups, but also to come together and have fun. Um, so that is something that I will be reaching out to y'all about when we have that up and running again, and just some different social groups, wellness and advocacy. So um, be sure and check the calendar just to make sure that they're going on, but, but that is definitely um, a place to, to check out. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was intimate partner violence. It is Intimate Partner Violence Awareness Month, which uh -huh. is the purple ribbon on. Um, and we do have a crisis counselor that works with um, victims and survivors of intimate partner violence. So we really um, understand that this can look a lot different sometimes in LGBTQ plus relationships. And it's great to have someone that's affirming throughout that process. So um, our counselor is named Rebecca Rose and she um, will basically guide you through the entire process. And, um, and we'll make sure, I mean, from, from going to court visits with you, if that's what it takes um, to um, getting you connected with mental health support and all sorts of things. So there's, um, you can see some of the things that Rebecca can take you, can take care of. So that's just something that we really wanna highlight particularly this month. Um, so just know that, you know, if you or someone that you know is dealing with intimate partner violence, please don't hesitate to reach out or if you would just like some more information, um, that's a great, we're a great resource for that as well. Um, we also have mail order condoms. So if you need some condoms, we can mail them out to you. Um, housing, you know, is one of our biggest programs and we, we do a lot of housing support. Um, I did want to just quickly before I turn it over to Kathleen, show you um, the help tab. Um, this is where you can sign up to volunteer. So if you're really interested in volunteering with the LGBT Life Center, we're always looking for folks that are passionate about helping. Um, so feel free to click on volunteer and that will take you to our online sign up form. So once you fill that out, you'll be in our database and we can um, contact you. You'll get our volunteer newsletter and hear about upcoming opportunities. And then- um, I have a question really quickly, Casey. Yeah. Um, is there a training for your volunteers and orientation? Yeah, so we are developing an orientation program for volunteers. Um, it hasn't rolled out yet. So right now we're just kind of working with our population right now, but um, we're looking to have a monthly um, date that's set um, to have an orientation for folks, just so you can kind of know more about the agency and be able to talk about it more and understand the services that we offer. Um, but also just to build community around our volunteers because we know that, you know, sometimes when you volunteer, you know, the experience is not as um, uh, fulfilling as we'd like. So we want to mm -hmm. make sure that we're creating opportunities for folks to also like have social um, aspect and feel a part of our community and a part of our agency. So, so that is gonna be coming up, but for now, this is the process, um, but we will be reaching out um, with orientation opportunities um, also in the coming months. Okay, um, thank you. So I think that's kind of, I've spoken a lot already I, and you can feel free to explore the website. Um, it's a beautiful website. Thank you, yeah. Um, Corey Moore is our marketing and PR manager and he's done a great job of putting that together. We also have wonderful social media. I don't know if you're connected with us on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, but we have a very active social media and Corey is always, you know, posting great things on there. So feel free to check that out and follow us. Um, I'm also going to put my email address in the chat box. So that way you can also reach out to me directly 
if you have any questions or concerns or just you know looking to to chat about whatever honestly like you can you can email me with with whatever you have if it's you know about your career goals or you know just helping you know start up a club or finding programming um, for your groups just just yeah reach out to me and thanks for for having me Thanks for being here. Um, I have so much. I do go to the LGB Black Center. I have not been to the one on Monticello, but I have been the one on 24 for testing and other things. So I do like that center. And I have not explored the website. So thanks for giving us a tour of that. Yeah, you're welcome. And um, yeah, we do have multiple locations. So um, the main location is that Port 1 location on 24th and Llewellyn. And then we have that clinic on Monticello, but we also have our housing location, which is on Granby. So you might pass by that house on Granby across from the park there. That's also yeah. where our housing services are located. How now, new is the housing program, Casey? What's that? How new is the housing program? Oh gosh, they've been doing housing for, for a long time. Um, I think even longer than we've had um, the LGBT center. Mm -hmm. So so they used to work with um, people living with HIV, getting them housing assistance. Um, so like I said, that expanded. Um, but yeah, that, that was actually one of our, you know, um, oldest kind of programs. We've always done housing um, because there's always been a need for housing. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mention this, it's not up on the website, but we do have a food pantry too. Um, it's a new, I mean, we've kind of done it informally throughout the years, but um, we're actually formalizing it now because of COVID. Obviously, food insecurity has, um, you know, it's always been an issue in our communities, but now it's even more of an issue. So we are rolling out our Pride Pantry. So that's going to be a food pantry program that anybody in our community can take part in and, and get the food um, assistance that you need. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we'll stay tuned and, and, we're also doing a Thanksgiving drive. Um, last year, we served almost 400 families um, to put a Thanksgiving meal on the table. And this year, we're looking to increase that. So if you're interested in participating in the food drive or just have some canned goods or things you'd like to donate, um, please reach out to us or go to one of our locations and you can drop those off um, so we can help serve the community and give them a nice uh, meal. That's awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to hear from Kathleen Rose, um, the Director of Gay and Cultural Studies at ODU. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I know at this point, probably we're all Zoom tired, right? <laughs> um, so what I promised to show you in this PowerPoint is mostly photographs. I really love photographs. Um, but as Arlethea said, I'm the director of gay cultural studies at ODU. Um, my email address is here and um, in just a minute, I'll put a link in the chat to sign up for our newsletter if you want to stay up to date about our events. Our events are always open to, of course, the ODU campus, but also the wider community as well. And one of the things that I think is really important is thinking about how to um, solidify the connections between what's happening at TCC and what's happening at ODU because we share the same space. I actually used to teach at TCC uh, one million years ago, it feels like, um, but I was out on the Portsmouth campus um, and I really liked it there. So I, I always want us to think of ways to, to stay in better touch with each other. Um, but Gay Cultural Studies at ODU is about 10 years old. These are just some flyers that I'm popping up really fast to show you the kinds of things that we've done in those 10 years. Um, we have a speaker series, um, and that's a lot of what you saw on those flyers. Um, so I have some other photographs, there we go. Um, and we do workshops on campus. Um, we do, um, partnerships, we pair with both campus and community organizations um, to partner and bring different events to campus and to the community. And then I just have a couple of pictures here. I don't know if you can see, but I love this t-shirt. This is one of our speakers from two years ago, and she wore her Killer Dyke um, shirt. It was like a pulp novel. Um, but she was a, a really great speaker that came to talk about her book, Baby, You Are My Religion. Her name's Marie Cartier. 
Um, and then um, various other events that we've done. These are some of the board members from Gay Cultural Studies, along with some people from Alumni Relations. And then we had E. Patrick Harris here. He's a, um, a scholar who collects oral histories of, um, initially he was um, collecting queer black men's stories in mostly in the South. And then his second book was focusing on um, queer black women. So he was really interesting as well. Other things that Gay Cultural Studies does is we provide a lot of opportunities for students to do research and especially for undergraduates, which is not something that a lot of undergraduate students typically get to do. But our students in the last four years have presented at several local and regional conferences. Um, this was one um, of those students and another one. Um, the first was Samantha and this is Kira. And they were both presenting their research on local LGBTQ history. Um, and then we also have some upcoming courses. So this is, um, oh, I forgot to tell you that um, of what I actually do other than gay cultural studies at ODU is I teach in the women's studies department and I teach a lot of our queer studies classes. So every fall I teach queer studies. And then in the spring of this year, I'll be teaching a queer comics and graphic novels class that I'm really excited about. I felt like we needed something fun if we're gonna you know, continue through this pandemic and be online, mm -hmm. that we needed to read some comic books and some graphic novels. So we're mm -hmm. gonna do that. Um, but also several of my colleagues will be teaching classes. So another undergraduate class um, will be in criminal justice. That's the LGBTQ people, crime and justice. And then um, we have graduate courses as well. So the feminist and queer theory and queer of color critique classes would be graduate offerings at ODU. I'm just gonna glance over at my notes because I was mentioning before we got started that I did a, a very long interview this morning. And so my brain isn't functioning very well. I wanna make sure I'm telling you everything that I had for you. Um, okay. The other thing um, that we do is, there's no sound to this, but I love this student and she made this really cool um, kids story. This was mm -hmm. a, a year ago, a year and a half ago. She did this entire book. She made it. Wow. She wrote it, she used a program to illustrate it, she got it printed and everything. Um, but our students really get to seek out real world experiences and applications for the things that they're studying. So this was in queer studies and this was a way that she could um, let little kids know about local LGBTQ history was through this storybook. Other students have done things like created games or um, some of our education majors have created um, lesson plans that they could then take on to into their own classrooms. And in addition to that, our students also get a great deal of hands-on experiences and participate in service learning projects. So this is a group of students from my queer studies class three years ago. And this was the first walking tour that um, we put together as a class. Um, and they're listening, they're outside of what was then the um, um, Oh gosh, hang on. Um, oh, the church, I just forgot. Anyway, it was a really pivotal church in the area. Don't use my memory today as uh, any indication of how important it was because it was really central to queer history in the area. Um, but they're there, this is the second year of the tour. And so we really, um, we've done a couple of interesting things. So Dr. Ford, who was here earlier, did the first series of walking tours, LGBTQ walking tours in the area, but we've expanded that in several really exciting ways. So we moved outside of downtown Norfolk and that was the first time that there had ever been a tour that went outside of Norfolk or outside of downtown rather. And what that allowed us to do is get many more stories of women and many more stories of people of color because those stories really didn't often exist in downtown areas. So we're on a shuttle bus in this. We had three shuttle buses with students and community members. Um, this, most of these are students from my class and some of their friends. Um, and we like went out into the other parts of Norfolk. Uh, we got off of Granby Street in downtown. Um, and here's uh, another one of those students. She's actually at the um, 
uh, the narrow movie theater talking about queer history that happened there. And this student, we um, had so much stuff to do on the tour that we ran late. And so we had to come back to campus because our bus rental ran out. Um, but she gave the coolest presentation about softball in Norfolk. So if you don't know, um, actually there were there was a lot of national um, softball competition, gay softball teams that actually competed right here in Norfolk. And so she gave us a really cool explanation of that. So this was some of the service learning and hands-on work. Um, this was, uh, these two students are writing on the outside walls of Hershey Bar. So Hershey Bar was, the state's oldest lesbian bar when it was closed by the city of Norfolk in a, um, in a land purchase that the city did um, and then later demolished. And so we, right before that happened, we visited the bar and um, students wrote messages on the outside. And this picture is actually from the first year of our tour. And, you know, I naively thought that in what was that 2017, I was like, yeah, we're just some students. We're going to go talk about LGBTQ history. Well, we were met with um, some of the anti-gay protesters that you've probably seen at Pride every year. Um, and my students were uh, really happy. <laughs> so I just love this picture because it, it demonstrates a real resilience, I think. Um, and um, yeah, so I wanted to include that one. I loved it. Just more. Think, were you talking about UCN, Unitarian Church of Norfolk earlier? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Yes. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I'm like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure she's talking about UCN. Yes, thanks. I, I need that help with my brain a lot. Um, other things that students do are uh, they've collected oral histories in the area. So this was an interview that a student did um, with Bert McManus, who was a longtime bartender at Hershey Bar. Um, but oral histories are when you go out into the community and you, some community that you identify um, in this case, the local queer community, and you gather the stories of those people. And so um, students have done a variety of those. This is another student who, um, after her interview with Sheila Fortner, Sheila was a member of Mermaids in the Basement. So it was a really influential band in terms of women's music and lesbian music in Norfolk and Hampton Roads in general. And they're looking at lots of photographs um, of the band. So um, that's another way that students really get that kind of hands-on experience. And then other things that students do through gay cultural studies, another I think really powerful example is two years ago when Hershey Bar was actually um, in the fight to stay open. Um, many students, uh, many of them from my queer studies class, and then they brought friends with them and uh, dorm mates and stuff like that. Actually, we mobilized those students to go to city council meetings and talk to Norfolk City Council. And I have to tell you, it was one of the um, proudest moments and the most powerful moments that I've had as a professor watching students um, in front of, and I'm not going to play the video. Oh, I was hoping this isn't exactly the, the clip I wanted to show, but like you can kind of see in the background, this is not a student, this is an alum of ODU, but in the background, you see many of those ODU students and they, um, it is not easy to get in front of city council you get three minutes and then a buzzer goes off and talk about something like that. So they did this really, uh, it was a really powerful moment. And on this particular date, we packed uh, city council chambers um, and it was just a, a really cool thing to do, I think. Um, I also wanted to talk about, so that's gay cultural studies, but I also wanted to talk about what I do with the Tidewater Queer History Project. And this was a group that I founded um, five or six years ago at this point, and I also direct, but it's a community-based group that what I always say is we collect, we preserve, and we celebrate local LGBTQ history. So a lot of the stuff that I just talked about with gay cultural studies also has something to do with the Tidewater Queer History Project because I can't divide myself um, into separate things, and so they often overlap. Um, but some of the things that we've done in the community is we digitized our own. If you didn't know, Norfolk had a 22-year-long um, 
gay and lesbian and bisexual. It's not really accurate to call it more than that because there wasn't a lot of trans representation in there and queer wasn't really an identity until very late in the papers um, run. But for 22 years, starting in 1976 and until 1998, we had a gay, lesbian and bisexual newspaper in Norfolk. Super cool. Um, we had a full print run of it in the ODU library, but you had to go into the archives to look at it. And so I initiated the digitization of that. So now you can just type in our own community press in Google. It'll take you there and you can see those 22 years. Um, super cool to look at like the ads and things like that. So if you have a favorite bar or if you've heard about a bar before um, and you're like, I wanna know more about that, you can like type it in and probably find some information about it. Um, we also do those oral history interviews. So we have about 50 of those. The reason that my brain isn't working all that great right now is because I did a, an interview today with the um, LGBTQ liaison to the city manager's office in Virginia Beach. So they have a dedicated person. It's part of her job, not her whole job, but part of her job to think about ways that Virginia Beach can better serve LGBTQ uh, citizens. And they are doing some exciting stuff in Virginia Beach. In fact, one of the things that we talked about was that Pride Fest at the Beach event. Um, and also uh, how, you know, for the longest time, Norfolk has had this history of being the gay place. In fact, much more than anywhere else, even Richmond, the gay scene was in Norfolk, so much so that um, I had a guest speaker come into my class a couple of weeks ago, my queer studies class, and he said, if you said you were going to Norfolk, that meant you were gay, <laughs> like because there was so much gay stuff that was happening. I mean, at one point in the late 70s, there were something like 11 bars just in the city of Norfolk, um, which is crazy to think about. One of our other guest speakers was telling us how in the 80s and 90s that they would go out every night of the week. She said the only night they didn't go out was Monday nights. Uh, which I thought was weird. I was like, so you went out Sundays too? But they would go out um, and then they'd leave one place and go to another place. So that just tells you like how much of a scene there was for LGBTQ um, life in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, I was talking about those interviews. So we have about 50 of those interviews with various people in the community. Um, we also um, have created a physical archive and a digital archive. So we um, are collecting important historical documents. And when I say important historical documents, that's like notes and anything like from regular old people, t-shirts, buttons, those kinds of things that we're saving and collecting for the local community. And then as part of the Hershey bar, um, thing that happened a few years ago. I worked with the um, mayor. Um, so I had a meeting uh, with the mayor and uh, several of his staff and, um, and with two of my friends that also worked on the Hershey bar issue. And uh, we convinced them to do some things. So if you're, if you aren't gonna save the bar, then you need to do some other stuff. And one of those things was to think about gender inclusive bathrooms in city buildings. And that's something that they really ran with um, and did. We also advocated that the city uh, be more inclusive in terms of uh, covering um, trans healthcare issues through city um, healthcare uh, packages for city employees. Um, and uh, right now I am collaborating with the Virginia Beach Historic Preservation Commission to, um, they provided funding for me to do six of those oral history interviews. Today's was one of them um, to uncover Virginia Beach queer history and to preserve it for the future. So um, that's Gay Cultural Studies on Tidewater Queer History Project. I have a lot more photographs, but I'm not gonna show you the rest of them. I'll show you some other time, but I know we're close to the end here. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, right? That's awesome. I love that presentation. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. So I'm learning a lot of history because yeah, <laughs> I'm not from the area. I'm from the D.C. area. So I'm like, okay. I didn't even <laughs> know about Hershey's Bar. 
I feel so bad. Me neither. I mean, I, 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 oh. I used to live behind MJ's Tavern um, in Norfolk. Wait, is that the name of that bar? Mm-hmm, on Grandy? Yeah. Yeah. So you said you had been there, is that what you said? I've been there once um, because I used to live behind there in the high rise apartment oh. building that's behind there. I used to live there. Well, um, you know, there was actually, you know, if you go towards the bridge and there's those newer like condos or something that are over there, you could see yeah. them from the high rise. There is, before those buildings were there, there was a gay bar there for a while too. So there's a lot of queer oh. history over in your neighbor, your old neighborhood, I guess, if you don't <laughs> I live in a small rural town, so. Oh, well, I grew up, I didn't tell you all this, but I, I've lived in Virginia my entire life and I uh, grew up in Windsor. Anybody know where Windsor? Yes, I live in Southampton County. No way. Okay. Yes, okay. I live in Sedley, to oh, be specific. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, well then I'll, I'll, you'll get it when I say this. I, we didn't even live in town, right? So like the people who lived in the town of Windsor were the people who were like, they were metropolitan as far as we were concerned. I was like out in Colossi, right? Which is the <laughs> uh, uh, neighborhood. You can't really call it. I mean, it's a bunch of peanut stuff. <laughs> It really is. <laughs> yeah, but I have to tell you, one of the things that I was really, and I still am really interested with the Tidewater Queer History Project. And the reason I called it Tidewater Queer History instead of Hampton Roads Queer History is because I wanted us to really think about some of those smaller places. Like what did it mean to grow up queer in Southampton County? You know, and like, what is the queer history of Southampton County or Windsor or something like that? So <laughs> step to figure out. Yeah, That's it was wonderful to see the students so involved in the research of our area. Yeah. You know, I think it's because they get excited. You know, the thing that I love about the walking tour when we do it is we get to see where other queer people had been. You know, like they literally were walking in those same places and they were in that building. And when we moved into, uh, my partner and I, when we moved into our neighborhood, there had been a bar and I never even went to it because it, it closed before I moved to Norfolk. But there was this um, women's bar called Charlotte's Web. And when I found out, like we were moving into the neighborhood, I'm kind of pointing that way. So like through that window that's blinding you back there, mm -hmm. there's a little strip mall and nothing has been in it um, until recently a church bought it and renovated it. But that's where Charlotte's Web used to be. And I was like, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. We're moving to like, you know, a neighborhood that had a lesbian bar for a while. <laughs> cool yeah, stuff. usually whenever people live in like places that are, even though there's like democratic areas and we're considered a democratic state, it's if you go to other places, like I said before, Windsor, Southampton County, more rural, more Republican, they yeah. assume that there's actually not a lot of that history. Heck, I didn't even know some of that history. And it's really interesting and awesome because you connect with it so well. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, if you're ever interested in like working on some local country history, let me know because <laughs> I'm, I'm here for it. I think it's super cool. So that's a great, great point, Kathleen. Um, do you have students who are not students at Tidewater Community College working on the Tidewater Hist Queer History Project? Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't have a formal, um, the LGBT Life Center has like, so they are a well-oiled machine, right? Um, and by the way, Casey, I feel like we see each other, I see you more than I see my partner Robin these days on these Zoom calls. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I don't have like a formal kind of volunteer uh, training or anything like that, but I have worked with lots of students um, in sometimes formal and informal capacities. So like I had a student intern for a while, a couple of years ago and, um, but I'm always happy if people, I mean, it's a community-based organization. So, and I did not have, my training is not in history. I have my degrees in English. I studied computer science, actually. I was a software engineer for a while. I know. Oh, I wanna go yeah. into that. And uh, well, I uh, gave that up because I was like, you know, I really want to make the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> really, Kathleen? <laughs> and I'm just kidding. I knew I wasn't going to. I make the same now that I made as a software engineer. 
18 years ago. So, you know, um, <laughs> but I, I did leave software engineering to go back to grad school. And that's when I studied English and women's studies. So you don't even have to have like a history degree. Community history work is really about having the passion for preserving local queer history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's we're we're cool. at the hour, guys. Did um India, uh, David, did you want to engage directly with the organization or any of the speakers? I mean, this has just been really great. I I I really appreciate the time that you've taken to come and talk to us today and give us this history and let us know what resources are available around here because you know it seems I it, it just seems like the like the word needs to needs to get out. I just want to like go from here and just like just just spread the word even more because mm-hmm. it's just really cool. So thank you. Thank you, Casey and Kathleen, for keeping the work alive in Hampton Roads. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah. Oh. yeah, this is <laughs> incredible. I'm happy to do it. Yeah, I was going to say it's students who really keep me energized to do this sort of work. Um, Because I think any of us, Casey, you could probably attest to this too. I mean, it's hard work. Um, And, but students are, are so like youthful and energetic and interested. So yeah, the students are who keep me alive, just working in higher ed in general. (laughs) Um, I did notice that you had the flyer from Transformations when Heidi Schlippacher and I brought Clarissa Slee. Yes. Yes, that was a big program and we were really excited to host her at the college. So we were a co-sponsor. I, yeah, I want to make it really clear. Yes, like, because oh, yes. I are. <laughs> yes. A lot of those, a lot of times what we do is we partner with other organizations to say, hey, we're interested in this, you're interested in this, and we bring people mm-hmm. and yeah, but that that's was a great amazing. way to work anyway. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and that reminds me, you know, for those of you in leadership in India, I'm not sure where you are in terms of the group, but certainly if you're interested in doing these kinds of collaborations, I'm very happy to hear from people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as I was saying in a, in a previous GSA meeting, um, when I leave TCC, I plan on studying like interdisciplinary documentary and film and television. Um, so I have definitely thought about doing more documentaries. I like the history of documentaries. I watch, I will watch documentaries all day. <laughs> um, in fact, I was watching some last night on to this morning. I'm just like, I should probably go to bed. But, you know, so um. But yeah, I like to film and take photographs. I actually have a photo shoot tomorrow, but yeah. Well, you know what you can tell yourself, Arlethea, is you're researching, right? Like when you're watching a documentary at three o'clock in the morning, that's research for you. I actually do that because I look at documentaries to see how they made it. Yeah. And what technique did they use to obtain? And, you know, I, I look at how they edited the video what they what type of interview was it like I that's what I'm my one of my main reasons for watching documentary yeah yeah when you get any type of filmmaking training or anything like that then you watch films in a whole different way Mm -hmm. I do after taking those classes lighting and the sound and all that (laughs) I do me too I definitely do this is gonna sound bad. I do that with gaming all the time. This is gonna sound so bad. <laughs> Ga- Gabrielle is a major gamer, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I help streamers too. I'm a moderator for a couple. Of, I gotta keep an eye on that stuff. <laughs> Cool. David in the chat thanks everyone for this event. And we're thank you. Oh, we thank, thank you, David, for hey, David. being present with us. Um, what was I gonna say? So Casey and Kathleen, what are some things that you would expect to see at a community college as far as development around um, LGBT advocacy and inclusion for students? Um, And are there ways that our organization, um, our Gender and Sexuality Alliance, can be involved directly or support your initiatives that you have going on? 
Yeah, I would say um, we are always looking for for partnerships um, with with college colleges, campuses, student organizations, faculty staff organizations. So I would just say, you know, keep up that work, keep doing the outreach, um, finding, you know, people, administrators, you know, that can also help you find those ways um, and just build community. Um, and just don't get discouraged and please reach out to the LGBT Life Center. Um, like I said, I'm happy to help be, you know, that kind of advisor for your group and how you want to develop programming um, and, and reach out and uh, outreach into the community. Um, because I think, you know, um, Tidewater Community College and community colleges all over, you know, need these types of resources. You know, I think a lot of times we think about four-year universities, mm -hmm. they have a lot more funding, they have a lot mm -hmm. more, you know, um, student services. So finding ways to work within your constraints, but then finding strategic partnerships mm -hmm. with other colleges, you know, mm -hmm. you could partner with Saga at ODU or mm -hmm. at CNU, mm -hmm. you know, find other college groups that are student orgs that are working around gender and sexuality. And just, yeah, because then you, you know, you have that effort and it kind of, you know, spreads it out over, you know, mm -hmm. a wider area. And it mm -hmm. also less work for you when you're partnering with others and collaborating. And you just get more voices and more experiences and identities into that space, right? Mm -hmm. And tightens the fabric of the community. Yeah, exactly. So just don't, you know, try not to silo yourself and really just put yourself out there and reach out and, and connect um, with, with me and the center and, and other people that you might interact with at the center, but also, you know, just peers and, and young people too, you know, like people, middle school, high school, like those, mm -hmm. people, you, know, you know, you think about your role as a young adult and the types of wisdom and, and knowledge that you can impart on that younger generation now. You don't have to be, you know, mm -hmm. my age or older to, to do that type of stuff, you know? I used to work with mentors at UT and that's what I would tell them. It's like, you can, you know, pass mm -hmm. on learned and you can help people and impact their lives. You know, even though you're, you know, 20 years old, like you have things that you can share. Mm -hmm. with you. That intergenerational work is very critical. It is and so, uh, so often much. taken for granted. Yeah. So that's kind of my my advice. And please do not hesitate to reach out. Yeah, I echo what Casey says. I think uh, I was really excited to hear the initiatives that you've already created. I think the Discord idea was a really good one. Um, and also the uh, discussion board. And I'm excited to hear that people were so interested. I think what that illustrates is that you have an audience that needs you in some way. Like um, even if, uh, Arlethea, you were saying earlier, like most of the responses on that discussion board were positive expressions of coming out, but they are still sharing those um, in this like public way. And so there is some need that you're filling for them. I think right now in particular because of COVID and um, how vulnerable it makes all populations, but particularly mm -hmm. LGBTQ populations and particularly community college LGBTQ mm -hmm. populations. I just um, think that you're doing something that's really important in terms of reaching out to students in that way. Um, and so I would say, keep doing that, keep coming up with those really good ideas. And then also, like I said before, I'm super interested in partnerships. So you know, one good thing, I mean, there's a couple of good things, like we get to hang out with cats and dogs a lot more than we used to and stuff. But one other really good thing that has come out of this pandemic is that um, we can reach people that we couldn't get. Mm -hmm. So before, when we wanted to have a guest speaker, we had to come up with the money to pay the speaker mm -hmm. and all their travel in their hotel. And that's a lot of money. Um, so now we can, it's much easier to say, hey, can we zoom you in? Um, and we could have a TCC ODU collaboration in that way. And so bring mm -hmm. in a guest speaker and um, share some of the costs or share some of the responsibility of mm -hmm. putting that event on. And I think that would be a really neat way because we have a built-in relationship. A lot of TCC students end up- uh, mm -hmm. At Old Dominion University. Um, and so, uh, it just makes sense, like 
for us to work together a lot more. So like Casey said, I think reaching out and, and figuring out ways, like what can we do to work together and partner? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that idea. Like even extending that beyond TCC and ODU to, you know, Virginia Wesley and Norfolk mm-hmm. State. And mm-hmm. you like having a, a GSA kind of college GSA, mm-hmm. just get together, mean greet, mm-hmm. maybe- some type of like it's cool maybe casey you can facilitate something like that i would love that yeah i think that's wonderful and and it would be a great way to yeah build community and also share just what types of what types of programming they're doing getting involved Mm -hmm. we can partner oh i'm getting excited there's so many (laughs) great ideas opportunities for collaboration so i'm happy to to help facilitate that too I like that. I love that idea, actually. I like it. I love it. Um, yeah, that would be really dope. So maybe even have like a conference or something, a yeah. Discord or something. Sure. Um, what do you think students need? Like, what do you think, to, uh, queer TCC students, what do you think they need or what do they want? Do you have a sense of that? Um, the problem? You go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Um, They probably want a sense of like, I guess like friendship in a sense, or they could somebody they can relate to in particular, because sometimes usually even if they know people who are part of that community, especially with what's going on right now, they feel like they need to connect with people as much as possible through any format possible, which is probably also part of the reason why, although it was online, people still posted their stories. Like, because that's an online format. So really people who maybe weren't for it saw it and they still went out of their way to post it. And I think that's really cool. So. And so, and and actually to provide some context to that, this is in our cam- Canvas shell. So it's not anonymous and there was no way to facilitate anonymity in that case. And they still were um, felt comfortable um, in because the way we contextualize it, we said TCC brave space, and we talked about how we are, you know, making efforts towards building inclusivity. And so we wanted to kind of infuse um, this courageous conversation around um, LGBT inclusion at the college, and students stepped up. Well, yeah, give yourselves a lot of credit because uh, in the days, you know, everything is a discussion board these days. So I'm just so impressed that students went in voluntarily mm-hmm. and discussion board posts in. Yeah, because at first we were like, so what are we going to call it? And are people actually going to do it? And it's like, okay, not really. Because at first we were like, so we need to put ours out there so that people feel comfortable, but before we could even put ours out there. That was really exciting, yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. And that's when we got the idea of Discord uh, and coming up with those ideas where everybody can watch movies together, play games together, just interact in general, so. You mentioned a trivia night. We did a trivia night, um, Gay Cultural Studies co-sponsored with um, the Alumni Association. And, you know, not a lot of people registered for it, honestly. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go. I had so much fun that night. And in fact, my partner got really into it. I was like, come on. Some of my students are in here, Robin. We can't. <laughs> and We got to uh, behave a little bit. Oh, but she was just like on it. She wanted to win it. And I was like, no, let's type a little slower just doesn't seem quite fair but it was a lot of fun you know like there was some music in the background and all kinds of questions some of them were really hard questions and uh, I was like oh no don't tell anybody I didn't know the answer to that question but uh, those things are fun she didn't know she didn't know the answer (laughs) yeah only oh that's just between the seven of us (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes Uh it would be probably be interesting if we could expand that a bit more. Yeah. Well, Casey, definitely get in touch with us when you're um, developing your game game nights. Absolutely, yeah. I think that you know I've sat in on a bunch of different seminars and meetings. <laughs> about 
the best ways to to engage um, young people because I think there's a lot of Zoom fatigue, mm-hmm. you know, like getting people to show up. Mm-hmm. You know, after they've been on Zoom all day, it's like, okay, you got to make it really, really good. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. I've been thinking about like, you know, like trivia night or drag bingo mm-hmm. or something that we can do just with performances, even or talent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like those, I think those feel exciting and like different, you know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I don't know about y'all, but I'm also like missing like performances and like going mm-hmm. out. So I think anything that we can do to also like, you know, experience joy. <laughs> yes, experience joy and um, also bring in, you know, performers that might, you know, also be struggling as well or just mm-hmm. outlets to perform and be creative because that's so healing for so many of us. Mm-hmm. Those outlets. So I'm trying to, yeah, get creative and think about also like art and like art therapy you know like Mm. doing art together even if you're not like in a meeting but you're all on there like just like coloring or doing a project Mm -hmm. space maybe not you know I don't know there's just so many different opportunities I'm trying to get creative but I will definitely um reach out to y'all and and um yeah I'm excited I'm trying to, to, to hold a harness onto that, like excitement and the positivity around mm-hmm. like what opportunities we have now that we're in this virtual space. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I do really miss a lot of in-person stuff. So that's that. I know that we are way past time, but I wanted to um, say to you, Kathleen, it would be really great to have some of the alum from that have contributed research to be speakers here at Tidewater Community yeah. College. Oh, yeah. I, I was have... particularly interested in that children's book. Mm-hmm. And even though there was no sound, I felt the passion in that student. Yeah. I have the sound to it. I just didn't put it in the slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I video a lot of stuff that they do because it's just so cool. I think that several of them would love to do that. Mm-hmm. So we should make arrangements for that in the spring. Mm-hmm. And I think I sent you um, a flyer, but w- I'm also going to have a walking tour flyer so that okay. our this year is happening in uh november i'll send you that as well alicia and then um, if anybody else reaches out i'll send that to you as well um yeah yeah i would love for people to join us on the walking tour i mean Mm -hmm. it's another zoom session but it's a zoom session where we talk about queer people so Mm -hmm. (laughs) make it a little easier all right arlethea gabrielle do you want to bring us to a close because we can do this all day (laughs) (laughs) yeah It would be fun, but I think as everybody has stayed in Zoom fatigue has been getting everybody. So, well, Casey, Kathleen, thank you so much for coming and letting us know of all the opportunities that we have and all the information. Yes, David, the uh, ASL version of clapping. (laughs) Um, It was very fun having y'all. We feel very grateful that you were here. And I know Mr. Ford had to leave and thank him too. He might see the recording someday. I don't know. <laughs> um, thank you to everybody who came and who will potentially be watching this. And yeah. <laughs> All right. That's wonderful. We keep pressing forward with pride and in solidarity. Yep. Yeah. Take good care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>